Hey and welcome back to a new video. It's finally time to upgrade my personal PC. About six years ago I featured Project Irrationality on this channel and Irrational is also this thing, which is the RTX Pro 6000. 10,000 euros of a workstation graphics card. Now the thing is, I mainly want to game with it. So can I use it for gaming? That's what I want to find out in today's video. The Seasonic Prime PX2200 is currently one of the strongest PSUs available and it comes with two native PCIe 5.1 connectors, which allow us to even hook up natively to RTX 5090. That is perfect for any overclocking system or high-end workstations. I'm also currently running this PSU and so far I'm really satisfied with its quality and performance. The cables are very flexible, there are also cable comps included and in addition also a 90 degree ATX 24 pin adapter which also functions as a PSU tester at the same time. The fan is semi-passive and even at a high load it is still very quiet. Find all information about this PSU in the link in the description. The RTX Pro 6000 basically has the same GB202 GPU as the RTX 5090 just with everything unlocked. The result is a GPU with 24,064 shading units and that's 11% more than the RTX 5090 and in the same relation obviously also more TMUs, ROPs and so on. It also has increased power consumption to 600 watts which is 4% over the 5090. In addition, the RTX Pro 6000 features 96GB of GDDR7 memory. That's split up in 32 ICs of 3GB each. And compared to an RTX 5090, it's not only occupying the front side of the PCB, but also the full size of the back side of the PCB. And now, if you're an RTX 5090 owner, you should probably realize that at this point you're only owning a mid-range GPU. And if you are wondering why, here is the reason. And this might be a little bit inspired by Nvidia's benchmarking. So we're looking at Cyberpunk 2077 4K with ray tracing and path tracing. And yes, the Pro 6000 is 612% faster than the RTX 5090. When we're looking at the average FPS, it only consumes 2% more power. Impossible without artificial intelligence. And if you think this benchmark was not fair, I just didn't want to pull you out of the NVIDIA comfort zone for now. So before we get to more benchmarks, I want to just take a look, a closer look at this card because this is an amazing looking GPU. First look, the card is not that much different to what you're used to by the 5090 or the 5080 Founders Edition. We have two big fans, one on the left, one on the right, and so it's the, still the same double flow through design, also with three PCBs. So we have the main PCB in the center, we have the small I.O. or maybe like the PCIe PCB on the bottom, and then the I.O. PCB on the left. If we compare 5090 and the Pro 6000 directly to each other, you will notice some differences. For example, what is closed right here or in the corner still has somewhat of a heatsink design to it right here. And also those triangles or tacos that we are calling it, on the 5090 or 5080 it has like a matte finish and on the Pro 6000 it's a glossy finish. And first I thought, okay, this looks like plastic, but it's actually not. I noticed that by looking at the card from the side because there is this small opening gap thing right here. If we take this, you will be able to see that it's milled aluminium. So this piece with also the glossy finish on the side, this is aluminium with two magnets in here. And that's also one difference to the 5090, there are two small additional connectors underneath. And inspecting the back side of the card, I mean this is a 5080 but 5080 and 5090 is the same when it comes to just the outside cooler design, but you will notice that this cross in the center is a little bit different, it's like closed here, it's open here, so the heatsink design is a little bit different and obviously the finish. Apart from that, not a big difference outside. Those connectors on the side highlight again that it's a workstation graphics card because they are for synchronizing the outputs of multiple of these. So if you would run four of them inside a system, you can synchronize the display output. It's not like SLI, so you're not synchronizing the GPU, what it's doing, but it's synchronizing the display output if you want to run, I don't know, like 16 displays at once. Now the thing is, I want to use this for gaming. Can I use this for gaming? Because it's not using the normal NVIDIA game ready driver. It's basically only one way to find out. If you buy the card, it comes in this box and mine looks heavily abused. I bought this on Pro Shop and you know, like all the scratches and everything. Yeah, thanks for nothing Pro Shop. And yeah, you probably have seen it already. The card is also using the 12 volt high failure connector and it has the same adapter included as a normal 5090. When the card is running, it's not more special than a 5080 or 5090. 
there's honestly not a big difference. You can also see on the right, if you peek to my monitor, you can see that I'm just sitting in idle in Windows. So one difference is that there is no semi-passive fan. I think they just probably say, all right, it's a workstation card. It's probably fine if you can hear a little bit of fan noise, but it will keep the card colder at all times. And this probably slightly increases the lifespan of the card. That's just pure guessing from my side. At least it's not semi-passive. GPUC 2.66 is now also detecting this card with a GB202 in full size 24,000 shader units, 96 gigabyte of GDDR7. Driver version is 573.24. So that's the workstation driver that is always slightly behind the game ready driver. And by the way, the memory is running at the same speed as on the 5090. So also with a 1750 megahertz, even though it's much higher capacity. And because the fans are also always spinning in idle, as I said, 12,000 RPM at least. The card is also super cool. It's below 30 degrees on the GPU and about 34 on the memory. In the driver, also interesting, you can change the ECC state. So the error correction, you can either enable or disable. Sounds a bit different after 20 minutes under load. It's, I mean, the 600 watts, they have to be dissipated, right? Also, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not too bad with the high fan noise. You can't hear how bad the coil wine is because honestly, I think this is, this is the worst coal, coil wine I have ever heard on a graphics card. It's insanely loud. Obviously it depends on the benchmark. Sometimes with higher frame rates, it's a lot worse, but I mean, you know, what would you expect for 10 grand, right? And now running 3 Mark Time Spec Stream GT1 to get a real impression of the performance of this graphics card. And we're getting about 175 FPS. And now if we look at the clean results in 3 Mark Time Spec Stream GT1, the RTX Pro 6000 is always utilizing its 600 watts, which is 11% more power draw than the RTX 5090, but it's also 13% faster. If we compare this with the 4090, the RTX Pro 6000 is 43% faster but it's also pulling 598 watts, which is 54% more. And while the Timespy Extreme GT1 is great to just perform the pure raster performance, we can use the Speedway to also compare the ray tracing performance. And here the thing is that the 5090 is already quite a bit faster than the 4090 when it just comes to the ray tracing performance, which is why the Pro 6000 is only 8% faster than the 5090, but it's also only slightly increasing in power draw. Compared to the 4090, it's 56% faster. One thing is a bit odd on the Pro 6000, and that's how much you're allowed to modify using MSI Afterburner. In the past, workstation graphics cards often didn't allow anything, so no modification to power target, no modification to clocks or whatever. And here it's, it's kind of the opposite compared to a 5090. In Afterburner, if you had a 5090, you can only go to 70% power target. So you cannot make your card more efficient than that. But with the Pro 6000, you can go as low as 25%. For example, if you would set it to 50%, currently the card is pulling almost 600 watts. If we apply this, we're lowering the power draw to 300 watts. Now we can use this feature to test the card on efficiency by lowering the power target. If you don't know what a power target is, 100% equals 600 watts. That's the max the card is allowed to draw. And then, for example, as I showed you, we can lower this to 50%, which only allows the card to draw 300 watts. So the card would automatically lower stuff like the clock. And if you would ask yourself the question, why would you do that? It usually causes the card to work much more efficiently. For example, if we use 3D Mark Speedway again, RTX Pro 6000 and lower the power target to 75%. This is extremely interesting because the card is now drawing 100 watts less power, but it's exactly performing the same as the RTX 5090 while just consuming 100 watts less power. Now, if we tune this further and put the power target to 50%, the RTX Pro 6000 is only consuming 300 watts. But with 105.1 FPS, it's still 4% faster than a 4090, but just much more efficient. Only if we go lower to like 30% and below, it's getting worse. So we're actually decreasing the efficiency. 
I'm also 100% sure that Nvidia knows exactly that this is what's happening, that you can make those cards much more efficient. That's also why the Max-Q edition exists. The Max-Q of this card is exactly the same GPU, just running at 50% power target. And that brings me back to the RTX 5090 and leaves the question, why are we limited to the 70% power target? Why can we not tune this further? Like it was possible, for example, on the 4090, but with the 5090, they, for whatever reason, changed this and kind of blocked, making the card more efficient. I also tested the power scaling in more detail from 30 to 100% in time spy. So this yellow curve is the behavior of the RTX Pro 6000. With the max power draw of 600 watts, we're seeing 176.5 FPS. If we are decreasing the power consumption by 10%, so limiting to 540 watts, it's still 176.1 FPS. And that's also an interesting point, because you can see directly underneath with the blue dot, that's the RTX 5090. And at the exact same power consumption, the RTX Pro 6000 is about 13% faster. Interesting is also the detail if we would draw a horizontal line for our 5090. This would equal the point of the same performance, but the RTX Pro 6000 would consume 150 watts less power. At the same power draw, the RTX Pro 6000 is about 20% faster than the RTX 4090. But now obviously gaming, because that's what I said earlier in the video, I want to use this card in my personal rig and I'm, you know, I'm running 3D Mark, but not daily and I want to use it for gaming. So can it run games and how does it perform? How does it perform without the game ready driver? Because it's using a workstation driver. Can it run games? Yes, it can. And now real benchmarks without fooling around with MFG Cyberpunk in 4K. We can see that the Pro 6000 is 14% faster than the 5090 while consuming 15% more power. It also beats a 4090 by 67%, which is absolutely impressive. I could observe a similar performance uplift in Star Wars Outlaws in 4K. 11% extra performance over the 5090 while also drawing 11% more power. And the same 11% again in Remnant 2, at least if we just look at the average FPS. But if we look at the minimum FPS, it was 17% faster while only consuming 5% more power. Only in Assassin's Creed Mirage, the difference was quite a bit smaller to the 5090, only about 3 to 7% more performance. And this could definitely be a driver thing, but I'm not quite sure why the performance uplift here was so little. The RTX Pro 6000 is exactly what I was looking for. Absolutely irrational to buy this card, extremely expensive, but also very high performance. The only thing that I find a bit annoying is the coil wine. And also, I can't really relate to what Jensen was promising to me. That's right. The more you buy, the more you save. You know, having 10,000 euros less on your bank account, it feels exactly like having 10,000 euros less on, a, on your bank account. I don't feel like I saved anything. But you know who's saving up money? Nvidia, by people buying this graphics card because it's just extremely expensive. And especially if you look at this in relation to a 5090 because you get a little bit of extra performance and you get 64 gigabyte more memory. But in relation, I just tried to check how expensive this is and the additional 64 gigabyte of memory, they come to about 200 euros, 200 US dollars more cost in making the card. But then you're going from 2,000 US dollars to 10,000 in the price of the card. You get a full, full size GB202 and obviously the yield rate of those is not as high as on the 5090. We don't know the exact numbers, but I also don't think it's that terrible. The RTX Pro 6000 also is a prime example how Nvidia contradicts itself. When it comes to the performance, if you remember the RTX 5090 launch, Nvidia heavily argumented that it's like physically not possible to get more performance like natively out of the GPU, which is obviously not true. Because if this was the 5090, it was 40% faster than a 4090 instead of being 25% faster. But they, you know, they chose to upsell this card for 10,000 euros, which, you know, I'm not blaming them for doing that. I would probably do the same if I was Nvidia. But then I wouldn't lie about the performance or why it's not possible to get more performance. Because in the end, the RTX 5090 is like the waste, the garbage out of the production of these. Nvidia, you know, they're making more money on this, much more money. And they would always aim for making the full size, like not cut down GB202 because you can just sell it for more money. And in the end, the RTX 5090, it's, it's the waste. 
out of this. You're, you're buying a garbage cart. And I'm sorry, I, ho I hope I didn't break your heart if you're a 5090 owner, but you probably also wouldn't want to spend 10,000 euros because in relation, it just wouldn't make any sense. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Next time we will probably tear this card down. See you next time. Bye-bye.